All right, well, let's uh, have a quick round of applause for our, our panel. Thank you for volunteering to uh, get up here and answer some questions. So thank you very much. And I'm going to ask a series of questions. And what we'll do is, well, on the first one, we'll just pass the mic around. You all can fight over it. Or hopefully, we can work this all out, like gentlemen. And um, on, the, on the first question, you know, say who you are. You know, state your name and uh, you know, who, you, who you are, where you're from, uh, what your deal is. And then we'll get to the answers. So the, the first question is, what brought you to the Kazoo platform initially? And uh, what pros and cons have you experienced? My name is Mark. Okay. My name is Mark Cedarloff. I'm with uh, VSR. Uh, we've been a company around for a long time, but we're primarily focused on a uh, a reseller third-party type of a product. And we wanted to be able to find a and leverage the experience of of other folks who have done all the due diligence and the enormous engineering aspects of what what these guys have done. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel, but we wanted to get the market as quick as possible. We wanted to take our engineering resources and focus them on specific vertical markets and other applications rather than deal with the core infrastructure. So we, uh, we've been using the platform for several years and have had just phenomenal uh, success with it. Hi, uh, Rick from Clearing. Uh, we started out as an IT consulting company. And um, the reason we came to plat uh, to uh, 2600 hertz originally was the uh, reliability, which is insane. Um, you know, we also really like the idea that everything's powered through API, uh, so that you know we could eventually hook our tools in. Uh, we still haven't done that, but you know it's there, um, and and that was important to us. Um, and the scalability was uh, another really big piece for me. Before we were, you know, I don't know if you ever heard Darren. Darren likes to talk about you know, uh, why they started the project. Well, we were like the, the perfect example of why they started the project. You know, we had a VM with a, with a free switch instance in each VM, right? And we were like, you know, replicating it with a DB and it was, it was nasty. Um, so uh, we, when, we, when we got the opportunity and, uh, the, you know, we, we jumped on it, especially uh, when they started talking about the HOSA platform, we were all over that. Uh, my name is Brian Chamberlain. I'm with a company called IP Telecom from Dublin. Um, we're in business about seven years. Primarily, we were doing SIP trunking, and we started getting much more demand for hosted PBX services. Uh, so we were running an asterisk stack, and we started to realize how difficult it was to scale um, this. So we discovered the Whistle project at the time. I think that's about three and a half, four years ago. And we started playing with it. and. You know, it was solving all the different problems that we were facing. So we reached out to 2600 Hertz. Um, they did a, an installation on our infrastructure, and it's been just a joy to work with for the past uh, three years. Very, very stable. Scalability is perfect. So. I'm sorry, what was the question again? No. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to come at this from a completely different angle, I think. Uh, so I ended up at 2600 Hertz, but I ended up in this industry. I'm just a business development guy, to be honest with you. I wanted to build a sales and support organization, and I chose this particular situation because of an opportunity that pretty much landed in my lap. So um, when we first started out, we were with Shortel. That's how it just ended up. We were the only white label reseller for Shortel in the country, and that was grandfathered in through some acquisitions um, from M5 and a company called Gecko Tech, which the owner of Gecko Tech is in here somewhere, the previous owner, Josh Robin, there he is. So it was a unique angle. Uh, so I don't have much technical experience. I am a business development guy. I'm a process guy. I'm a consultant. And I ended up buying this company. And uh, so we get into the scenario and situation and the relationship with Shortel, let's just say it wasn't blooming. <laughs> but um, so we ended up looking around. And actually, I think it was Josh that mentioned to uh, take a look at 2600 Hertz. And I was lucky enough, uh, I think on a rare occasion before a sale, especially for a small guy like us, to meet with Darren directly. And I just love the idea. Uh, for me, there's a specific model of support. They honor that. We honor our relationship with them. And it's just been, uh, it's been fantastic. So we jumped away from buying a box, changing it to our box, and putting it into the field to actually going through the FCC regulatory things and jumping in and just really becoming an actual reseller, um, but more appropriately, uh, 
the taxation and all that type of stuff as well. So for us, we were just really looking for that partner that was going to grow with us, give us the opportunity and the support to do that, and it's been fantastic so far. So I guess you can just keep, hold on to it now. We'll work our way back here. So uh, what competitive advantages do you feel that you have uh, as a reseller of the product? I think it's flexibility. There's, um, you know, for us, there's so much flexibility and opportunity with 2600 hertz that they bring that it's almost too much. So for me, I want to simplify and repeat. So I, we standardized on specifically polycom phones. We standardized on specifically these types of things, but they all work well within the 2600 hertz system. And it makes it easy for me to go to market, um, and it makes it easy for me to support, and not me specifically, but David and Jesse and Marie's right here somewhere. But, um, but for me, it's, it's the advantage of knowing that if I have a problem, it's going to get solved, it's gonna get solved in a timely manner, which is not always the case. So that is a big advantage as far as I'm concerned in the marketplace. Yeah, the, the feature set, uh, I was just thinking about it when the guys were discussing WebSockets and WebRTC, the fact that this stuff just gets added to the platform and is available to everybody that's using the platform um, is amazing. The, uh, it's changed the way we, we think about our business. We're, we're becoming more uh, software development uh, using the, the, the APIs a lot more now. Um, and I think the, the flexibility of being able to provision a PBX from your own software is, is, is brilliant. Um, the support that we get from 2600 hertz as well, uh, we don't call on them that much, but when we do need to, they're there and they fix any issues that we ever come up with. Yeah, I mean, I hate to repeat what everyone else said, but yeah, it, it really is the flexibility. I feel like with most of our competitors, they're jamming them into one box or another that they have. Um, and, you know, we can really go in there and say, oh, well, what you want to do is a little weird, but we can definitely accommodate that and, uh, and get you taken care of for your business needs. A lot for us has to do with the flexibility as well as and the APIs. We um, focus on very specific vertical markets and having the ability for us to write custom applications for that particular vertical market has really given us the ability to differentiate ourselves from all the other competition out there. And that's, that's the biggest part of it. And reliability. We don't have to worry about, is our system going to fail? It, it doesn't fail. And I'll, I'll throw in some from our personal experience too, is uh, my guys love the UI. I know they were, they, they, they're not crazy about Kazoo UI, but just when our guys who were used to dealing with asterisk as a user interface to try to set things up, and then we showed them this, this actual sensible visual thing where anybody can look at it and go, oh, I know what that does, and I know what I need to do next. And it, that just gave us an advantage because you know, what, when we allow clients to see into that from a sales perspective, they're like, this is the first telephony thing I've ever seen that made any sense to me as a business owner. Um, so who do you think is the biggest competitor in your market, and uh, what do you see more of? Well, in our market, we focus on the hospitality market, the hotels, and that type of an application. And there, you know, the, the, the main competitor is still premise-based PBXs, MyTels, and, and those types of folks. Uh, so with our solution, we're able to basically go into a, a hotel and provide them a turnkey total solution with everything for about what they're paying just for dial tone. So we can come in there and... and throw away that 40-year-old Mitel phone system and be their carrier, their phone system, their integration with all their back office systems, their wake-up call systems, everything. And basically, you can come in there and give them um, a turnkey solution. And in our particular market, if there isn't a compelling reason to save them money or their existing system's on fire, then there really is no point of a discussion. So we usually can accommodate one of those two things with uh, our particular vertical market. Um, for us, I guess um, probably Ring Central would be our biggest competitor. Um, you know, it, when you, and basically how we address that is, you know, we have a saying around my company which is, you know, everything is our fault, right? And so, um, you know, when the router is not, you know, uh, responding correctly or they've run out of bandwidth or they don't have QoS set up right or there's problems with Cox Communications in my network. Um, you know, we'll help the customer address that problem, if not address it for them. So, um, 
And then, uh, yeah, like you said, <laughs> going up against, as crazy as it sounds in, in today's environment, going up against the landline PBX. It's insane to me that we're still there, but, but really it is a conversation that we have on a regular basis. Uh, yes, you really should deploy uh, on a cloud-based system over an Avaya um, a box. Uh, it, it's weird to me that we have that conversation so often, but we do. Yeah, on, on the smaller kind of 10 to 20, 30 user sites, um, we don't, you know, we, we kind of win most of that business. Um, when you start getting into the larger government and enterprise organizations, we're starting to come across Skype for Business a lot more um, in Ireland, and particularly governmental organizations for some reason. I think they get a very sweet licensing deal. Um, it, that would be what I would see as, as kind of a competitor. When they open up uh, their PSTN access completely, I don't know if that's happened over here yet, it's starting to happen in Europe, um, then I think that they would be sort of one of the people we would be looking at. So for us, um, we're based out of Chicago, so a big majority of our uh, customer base is out there, um, but you know, it's still the same nationwide. We're in about 16 other states, something like that, but it's all based on relationships. We don't necessarily market in any other market. But um, you know, what I really see out there is, is at times we get this price thing, you know, speaking of Ring Central's, or well, or how can you beat Ring Central's price? And for me, it's a differentiator for us to redirect and say, well, why would you want that price if you're going to get that service? So um, we over-service our customers. We really, really try hard. You know, to your point earlier, um, one of our key values is that at CBV, we hold ourselves accountable to the customer's perception of quality service and support, not necessarily our own for having a bad day, whatever it may be. So if somebody comes to me and says, uh, in the marketplace, I see Ring Central is at $19 a seat. Uh, you need to beat that price. And I say, thank you for the opportunity, but you're not my customer. Um, but I, I don't run into that very often. When uh, we get a chance to redirect our customers, so you can either sell on a seat price basis, or what I like to do is I try to manipulate the opportunity by going with call paths. So I'll charge a certain number of call paths. How many call paths would you like? And then I would charge an access fee to access the, uh, the, the hosted PBX system. And that gets them thinking a little bit differently. And then you know we don't necessarily deny or turn on or off any services. Uh, unless it's like another license, and then we charge you know, mobility access, access or something along those lines. So um, when I do run into those situations, I just try to redirect the purchase to something value added, like our, we have a managed voice over IP offering where we manage, we take over management of the broadband provider, and then we layer whatever level of QoS we could on that connection. I know it's not end-to-end, -end, but you'd be surprised how it lowers down those uh, perception-based outages. Um, so I just try to redirect them towards, back towards the value chain, and if they don't see the value, then the chances are they're not my customer. But I'm not really seeing that many competitors out there like us, you know, where we care that much about our customers, and we also don't uh, require contracts. So that is a, a, another thing. Mm -hmm. that, you know, but, you know, the Ring Central is doing that as well. Vonage does the same thing. But uh, so for me, I do run into those guys every now and then. And if it turns out that I can't swing that customer from a business development perspective to see the value in our price that may not be the same, um, then they're not really my customer in the first place. So That's a good point. We differentiate ourselves on the service as well. Kind of like what you're saying, we have a, two unofficial sayings, one of which is that it's all our fault, to, to your point, and then the other one is uh, we suck less. And uh, people seem to like that one too. Uh, so what features have you heard this year at KazooCon that you're most excited about and why? And that's how much time do we have? No. <laughs> there, there's actually a lot of exciting things. You know, one of the, th um, you know, coming from uh, having some customers on Shortel and dealing with, you know, when you're, when you're migrating customers from one platform to another, whether you want to or not, those customers get used to some of the features and functionalities that that other provider has. Even though I may be the reseller, um, I still need to be able to say, you know, let's move those thousand phones over to this and that, but what about presence? You know, what about uh, the operator? That operator deal this morning was great. Um, I think there's just so many other things that give me the opportunity to say in a competitive environment, me too, which we didn't have, let's face it, a little while ago, and, and or in a migration strategy, maintaining that customer relationship with some of the tools and features that their existing system has, even mm -hmm. if it's a premise-based solution. So I'm really excited about that, being able to say me too, and uh, being able to migrate those customers with confidence. So. Yeah, the, the new data store uh, on the back end side that looks absolutely fantastic, being able to take uh, storing binaries out of out of big couch or out of couch is is brilliant being able to use google drive amazing to to store your voicemail or uh, whatever on the front end the um the, the operator panel 
that we, we looked at earlier on looks absolutely brilliant. Um, that's going to be a huge feature, um, you know, a, a selling point. And the big one is the queues, um, which, yeah, that's, it's great that it's finally arrived. I can't wait till we get a, a, a date that we can get it installed in our clusters. Um, but that's going to make a huge difference to us. Um, yeah, so for me, I think uh, WebSockets are really important to us. There's a few uh, development projects that we really want to get after. And I mentioned earlier, we haven't really dug into the API as much as I wanted to. And a lot of that's because we knew web WebSockets was coming and we kind of wanted to hold off until that was ready. So I'm really excited about WebSockets. Uh, also, being able to tie the uh, data store into AWS, not really because I want my information on AWS necessarily, but more because we'll have functional recording capabilities as, uh, without having to do this weird PHP you know, script and then do like users. And so I'm really excited about the AWS piece. Uh, and then, yeah, call center is uh, is going to be awesome, and we can't wait for that. Uh, we we're working around it right now by bed, by setting up some uh, ring groups, which are a little bit complicated, and uh, not the best way to be doing it. So I'm really excited to be able to uh, give those customers that stuck with us with ring groups uh, a better solution. Without a doubt, call center. For us, being able to provide um, that kind of functionality into the hospitality, into a small little hotel is fantastic because it's all about resources. They only have one person usually working at the front desk, and that person may have three or four calls backed up, and they just can't get to it. And so that's a, a huge uh, application that uh, we'll be able to push even into the smallest properties where it was just cost prohibitive to put in a standalone you know, call center ACD system uh, in, in past premise-based systems. Uh, and the second to back that up would probably be the call recording. Uh, it, it seems a lot simpler to be able to um, you know, you know, log those calls and, and access those calls. So those two things are, are we, we see revenue streams coming in off of both of those immediately. Well, I, I think I speak for everyone where it's faxing, right? <laughs> <laughs> No, death to faxing. Please, God, make it die. Um, yeah, I agree with call center. because we, we do premise-based systems as well, and there are a lot of times where we would love to be able to uh, offer a hosted solution for somebody, but we're pushed into having to do a premise-based system because of queues, recordings, and uh, the, all, all the things that you all previously mentioned, so we're very excited about it, too. Um, future of business telecom, where do you, you all see it going? I, I think people like to talk, and I don't see, in, in our particular vertical market, let me just tell you this, that the people that we sell to these hotels, they haven't changed their phone system in 40 years. So to, to you know, the, the stuff that we saw earlier today, I think that's fantastic, but I think it really depends on the audience and the, uh, what type of early adoption. So for our particular vertical market, we still see that there has to be a physical a device where someone is going to physically talk over, especially in a, in a guest room for emergency services. And for our particular um, world, we want to be able to push content into the room uh, to make that into a marketing opportunity for the, for the hotel. So rather than just having uh, a pure conversation, but we, we feel that we can get into the room in a non-obtrusive way uh, to deliver information to primarily keep that guest on premise rather than to take them off premise and go to their neighbors. Uh, bar or restaurant or whatever. So there's a lot of value that we see in uh, being able to come up with applications layered on top of the core infrastructure. Um, yeah, so we're, we're seeing kind of the same thing, which is, you know, uh, the conversation for us is, should we move off of our Panasonic, uh, you know, line-based system? Like, they're not even considering the PBX piece of it. Um, so, 
I hear a lot about soft phones, and sometimes I, I wonder if I'm like in this echo chamber where all I hear about from my clients is, you know, we want physical phones, we want physical phones, we want physical phones. Uh, and I hear a lot about WebRTC, and I think that stuff's awesome, but I think right now the customer just is, is still moving off of Panasonic-based line systems. Um, you know, we are looking at one vertical, uh, you know, virtual office suites where people kind of come and go really rapidly, and in that particular scenario, um, we're talking to, uh, uh, you know, a few owners of some executive suites and maybe we'll do some WebRTC uh, stuff with them. That'd be really awesome for them to be able to pull up a browser upon, upon account creation. But, uh, yeah. <coughs> it's 2016 and people are still sending faxes, so I think that is completely insane. Um, but WebRTC is going to be huge. I think it's going to change the call center industry um, in particular. We've got a customer that has you know, telephone numbers in pretty much most of the developed world, and there's constantly some problem with a carrier and you know, Mexico or wherever. So um, they're talking to us at the moment about having a browser-based system that their customers will log into and just click call us and we'll route the call to their call center. So I think that's gonna change. Uh, I, I think that will really change the way call centers interact with their, their customers. Um, phone numbers, I mean, as well, at some point in the future, I, you know, they're gonna go away, are they? Um, and we're going to be, you know, contacting people by an address of, of some description. Like the chap earlier on that, that was talking about the future of telecoms, you know, uh, you log into Facebook and it's, you know, you call people by their names. I, I do think the phone number isn't going to be around forever. Um, yeah. To me, this is like a complexity question. You know, depending on the complexity of the customer, I think that the, the path is going to be the same for like the simple, like the small, medium-sized customer. I don't think there's going to be that much going on unless their businesses change. But uh, I agree with the math or the path that we saw earlier today in the presentation in that it, it could potentially end up being a feature. You know, telephony is just a feature of a software application and it, and it just kind of comes with it. The, the one protection I would say out there is uh, the government. Uh, you got to love them because they're going to protect our industry for many, many years because they want and need the revenue. And I don't know until if these software companies are going to be able to become collection agents and will they be able to do it? I, I don't know. Or will they just partner with companies like 2600 Hertz or resellers like everyone else here uh, and say, will you guys do that portion of it and we'll just tag it in? But I do believe that, that taxation is, is going to save us. And it, 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 yes, it's not going anywhere as far as I'm concerned, but I think it does come down to complexity. All right, uh, last question. Uh, have you looked into having your own resellers? And if so, what, were the, what was the good and the bad of that experience? I really like this question because um, I say yes to resellers because uh, I don't necessarily believe in the model of business development and in-house. In uh, going around knocking on doors really comes down to your strategy, depends on your market, depends on your vertical, depends on what you're really going after and who you are as a company, right? So um, for me, I like to pay on success. And as long as the customer pays me, I'll pay them. But uh, when developing those relationships, I put a little bit of a caveat in there in that uh, I don't want someone to come in and park a deal in my system and then never sell again. So, in the, and you have an evergreen clause in your reseller agreement that says, as long as this customer's paying me, I will pay you. And then, they, and then you never hear from this person again, and you gotta continue to manage and maintain and support, and then you've gotta pay, write one check to one person. Now, I do have that all automated in that we do the, the accounts and it gets all figured out but um, we require a two sale a year minimum to maintain your relationship, which I think is fair. It doesn't have to be a big sale, it has to be one. I don't know, it doesn't matter, but at least they're active, at least they're interested. Um, and this to me seems like it's a little bit better. Now some resellers are better than others. Uh, I genuinely believe in partnerships like I have with 2600 Hertz. You know, they're, they're very core to the thing that I'm trying to build, which is a sales and support organization because I know I've got a really good quality back end system and support mechanism behind that. I've got great employees, David and Jesse and Marie and all those guys, but, um, or partners like Jesse. But um, so I, I, I say yes to resellers as long as you can manage and maintain them and as long as you've got a way to pay them. And uh, I wouldn't suggest paying them on a monthly basis. I pay on a quarterly basis. It makes the administration a lot less, um, but my experience has been good. Now there's other opportunities as well. If you have the, the, the capability and the relationships, you can go to master agents and skip going to individual agents altogether, which I would highly recommend. Go to a master agent and try to get them to put you into their particular catalog. There are master agents out there like TBI, Telecom Brokers Incorporated out of Chicago. Um, another one, Avant, but Avant's a little bit different. They're really cloud-based, probably wouldn't get in there. But there, there are a lot of master agent organizations out there, X4 is another one. 
And then if you can get into those, then you don't have to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship, which can be taxing. <clears throat> so, excuse me. So when you can get into those situations, you let one master agent manage all the agents, and plus it gives you an increased market to other agents to get at. Um, I would definitely go that particular direction in a reseller market. Um, but we don't have any plans to allow someone to resell our stuff under their brand or anything like that. But, so anyway. Yeah, we have partners in, in that, that sell our, our uh, services in Ireland. And we, we've learned a lot of, about that kind of channel over the past three years. Um, probably the most important part is the onboarding process um, when they become a, a partner giving them the tools to be able to support customers, um, be able to give the same level of support that we would give to customers, our direct customers. And it's been hugely successful for us. Um, I'd say it's probably a 50-50 split, the channel and, and direct business now. And, and Kazoo, the, the tier, the way it works, uh, I mean, it's you know it, it, it absolutely perfect for doing that type of business. Um, yeah, we, we do better with more of an agent type solution uh, where we just pay out a commission. Uh, we tried to do, apparently I speak really soft, sorry. Uh, we, you know, we tried to do a full reseller thing and um, as much as I love the 2600 Hertz platform, there's a lot of stuff that you have to do to get an account running at the end of the day. You know, you got to make the device and make the user account and associate them and, and, and you know, associate that with a voicemail. And even though it's not terribly complex, it's more complex than a lot of, we work with IT guys, a lot more complex than a lot of the IT guys, at least in Phoenix, really want to deal with. Um, so, you know, when we offer them, hey, you know, we can just cut you whatever percentage, you know, it, they kind of jump on that. And that, that's worked really well for us. Um, I've been working on this solution quite a bit, actually. Uh, Smart PBX is, got a whole lot of potential there. Um, and so we're, we're kind of thinking about making a tool to make onboarding more rapid um, and, and easy. So um, after we do that, I think maybe we'll have some more success with reselling and try it again. So we, we've been in this uh, for a while. We had third-party uh, premise-based systems and we had the traditional reseller distribution partner relationship where we would only sell through distribution partners and uh, authorized resellers. And that was fine for a long time, 20 plus years, uh, but we always were very sensitive to channel conflict. Uh, you cannot go around your distribution partners and your reseller partners and sell direct. Well, with the way the market has changed, uh, our channel, had a lot of those resellers who are interconnects and ISPs, and, and they're, they're gone. Uh, their, their businesses changed dramatically where they used to have uh, a huge team of uh, infrastructure and telecom technicians and CSRs and reps and all, all this kind of stuff. And that whole paradigm has changed dramatically. So, you know, we looked at real carefully, what do we want to do? How do we want to be able to go back to our existing channel and offer these types of uh, services and products? And without being able to go, uh, we did not want to go around them again. So basically what we did was we, uh, we do most of our business on a direct basis, but we allow a revenue share, which is similar to a commission, but they're participating in the process of bringing the customers on board. They're doing a lot of the, uh, uh, the it's, it's all about relationships. They have the relationships, they have their customer base, and a lot of these guys are looking for an exit strategy. They don't want to be out there with their technicians and, and having to do all this infrastructure and labor and, and people. So I think we give them a real good solution uh, that gives them a, a way to migrate their, their existing customers over to a, a reoccurring revenue stream and not have to deal with the ongoing basis. And so they can scale down their operation, but their end of the day, their revenue, their profitability goes up. So the business owners that we deal with love it because their responsibilities go down, they can leverage their investments and their existing strategic relationships, and they can uh, be able to have a long-term reoccurring revenue stream. So that's how we do it without the channel conflict, because that's the key. Um, similar to, to what y'all said, we, we're a little bit different in that um, we don't do resellers directly because we want to maintain our own brand and we want to maintain our own support and we're, we're pretty fanatical about how we take care of our clients. And in fact, we view them as a client relationship, not a customer relationship because we're more consultative and you know, we're so helping them solve business problems. So when someone brings uh, a client to us, 
we sort of, you know, we annualize what the, what the revenue is going to be, and we take a little bit of a risk, and we pay them an upfront pop. And if we lose the client, you know, quickly for some reason, which hasn't ever happened, but if that happens, we're exposed. And um, to us, that's been a little bit of a, a competitive advantage because the people that we're all talking about, lots of people are getting or knocking on their door wanting them to resell their, their type of, of, of product. And I think by us approaching it the way that we do, they feel that we have some skin in the game and that gives them some more conf confidence that we're going to take care of their customer. You know, we're not just going to kick them to the door and churn and burn. Um, but we're looking to grow that. We'll see how it goes. I could be dead wrong, but we'll find out. So, um, well, thank you very much to our panel. I'd like to appreciate you all. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your insights, and uh, that was very helpful.